power does not give in. It has to be taken. And, you know, I don't know how many times people have to be reminded of that. Yes, there can be good people uh, who want you to have that right, but they are still often fighting against forces arrayed against change, moving from the status quo. And as we see today, literally trying to turn the clock back. So, you know, those narrow margins uh, back then are a reminder that the struggle is not over today. Alice Paul and her staff do an incredible amount of outreach. They are reaching out to nearby states, to colleges, to small suffrage groups, anybody they can think of who would be interested in coming to demonstrate at the White House uh, for the suffrage amendment. So desperate was Paul for fresh recruits that she even issued invitations to local African-American activists setting aside her deep conviction that their presence risked turning a woman's protest into a racial one. 53-year-old Mary Church Terrell, a charter member of the NAACP and a longtime suffragist, answered the call more than once. Though she'd long ago resigned herself to the fact that white suffragists typically found it more expedient to exclude her. If you're a black woman, White women's racism is not news. Racism is the order of the day. You know what that is. But that's not exactly a reason to stay home. African-American women understood that the right to vote was yet another tool to try to dismantle the structures that were still in place even after the end of slavery and to ensure African-American safety and perhaps prosperity. So Mary Church Terrell was willing to join white women's protests to the extent that she believed it would ultimately deliver the vote for black women. For every show of solidarity, however, there was a defection. Paul was bombarded with letters protesting the picket, resignations, cancellations of the suffragist, even a plea from her mother to call off what she described as the undignified annoying of the president. Instead, the vigil continued, day in and day out, usually six days a week. By way of explanation, Paul offered an analogy. If a creditor stands before a man's house all day long demanding payment of his bill, the man must either remove the creditor or pay the bill. Alice has never lost her focus on Woodrow Wilson. In all these years, it's always been about Woodrow Wilson. And it's still about Woodrow Wilson, the man in the White House. So that was a clip from part two of our series, um, and I'm here with a fantastic panel of women. Um, my name is Michelle Farai. I'm the director, producer, and writer of The Vote, as Susan mentioned. Um, and I'm here with uh, women who, to my mind, need no introduction, um, but I'm going to ask them to say a little bit about themselves. Um, so first, Martha Jones, can you tell us a little bit about you? Sure. Um, first, thanks, Michelle, um, for the film and for bringing us together. Um, I teach history at Johns Hopkins University um, and have spent the last few years working on a new book, Vanguard, um, which examines how Black women come into public life, how they win the vote, and how they continue to influence politics even today in the 21st century. And then we have with us Elaine Weiss. Hello. Thank you, Michelle. And wonderful to be with you both on the film and, and today. Um, I am an author of the book, The Woman's Hour, which tells the story of the last battle to win ratification of the 19th Amendment in Nashville, Tennessee in 1920. So I tell the story of that last few uh, months and years of the movement and how American women had to fight to win the most basic right of a democracy. Mm 
And then lastly, we're incredibly honored to have with us Secretary Hillary Rodham Clinton. Um, Secretary, I don't think you really do need an introduction. That's not just flattery. Um, but if there's anything you'd like to say. Well, I want to add my words of appreciation, Michelle, for this documentary. Uh, it is so important, especially now when we're facing uh, a moral reckoning that is so long overdue uh, to learn more about our history, to understand more about how we got to where we are, both the good, the bad, and the very ugly. Uh, and what the vote does in two short hours, I could have watched a lot more, uh, is to provide uh, that basic foundational understanding of what it took uh, for women to get the right to vote. And as you rightly point out in the documentary, the continuing struggles of black women that uh, Professor Jones has just referenced. Um, as, as everyone knows, this year marks the centennial of the 19th Amendment, which as the story goes, gave or granted American women the right to vote. Um, those words gave and granted uh, make it sound like a gift, a singular event when in fact it was a 72 year struggle and in every way a process. Um, it should be said that I didn't realize any of that. I had no inkling of what it took for women to win the ballot until I worked on this project. And I have a graduate degree in American history. So I'd like to ask each of you why you think the suffrage movement is so unknown or at least so misunderstood and what it was what inspires you to want to tell the story anew? So, um, Martha, can we start with you? Why suffrage? Well, thank you. I think the first thing I'd say is that um, I've come to avoid the word suffrage. Um, I think because um, to young um, readers, it is a term that is not self-evident. But more importantly, I've come to really frame this story as one episode in a much longer story about the history of voting rights in the United States. For the African-American women um, about whom I write, um, the um, years that take us directly to the 19th Amendment are in many ways an extension of a longer struggle that goes back to the early 19th century, struggles waged by grandfathers and fathers and uncles and sons um, to get black men to the ballot and frankly brings us all the way to the 21st century and the issue of voter suppression, um, especially in communities of color across the United States. Um, so I think this is important because it not only gets us to thinking about that long past, but because it informs and really is the foundation for thinking critically about the present. But I wouldn't say suffrage and I would say voting rights. Fair enough. Um, Elaine, what about you? What made this an irresistible subject for you? It was irresistible because I knew very little about it. I, as an American woman, as someone who's politically active and politically aware and votes in every election, I realized that I had no idea how this happened. How um, at one point, uh, American women had the, did not have the vote. It was certainly not part of the founding fathers plan. And then at another, they do. And how did that happen? And I realized I had no idea my friends, when I asked them, had no idea. And it's just not been part of our education and not been part of our um, popular understanding of our history. And I just decided there needed to be uh, some uh, comprehension of how hard this was. That this was a, as Eleanor Smeal says in the documentary, we took it. It had to be um, fought for and won. And then of course it goes on way beyond 1920 um, for African-American women and Native American women and um, many other minorities. And today we're back fighting for, to protect voting rights. So it, it truly, I believe, I agree with Martha, it's this continuum and it's such an important part of our history. It's half of the nation. Right, absolutely. What about you, Secretary Clinton? What was the genesis of your interest in voting rights, as Martha would say, as opposed to women's suffrage? Well, my, my interest really um, peaked uh, when, as a senator representing New York, uh, 
uh, I traveled to Seneca Falls uh, for a commemoration of the Declaration of Sentiments uh, that was uh, agreed upon by a relatively small group of people, uh, including well-known suffragists and Frederick Douglass and others who came together uh, to talk about uh, women's rights and included, most controversially, uh, the right to vote. And that happened in 1848. And when I was preparing to go and speak at a commemorative uh, event there, I was actually quite stunned at how little I knew. Um, you know, voting rights uh, was something that I take very seriously. I still to this day can remember, you know, watching President Johnson's speech about uh, the Voting Rights Act in 1965. My first job in politics was registering people uh, to vote in uh, Southern Mexico, mostly Mexican Americans. And so you know, this to me was like a big revelation that there was so much about this struggle uh, that I was just not as knowledgeable about. We didn't study it in history. Uh, it was not a subject of much uh, attention in popular culture. Uh, so I became increasingly um, interested in it and the combination of struggles, uh, women's right to vote, uh, African Americans' right to vote, where they converged, where they uh, separated. And as Professor Jones just said, it is still our ongoing struggle. We saw in that first clip um, that suffragists led by the fierce and single-minded Alice Paul um, picketed the White House. And they were the first Americans to do that in history. Um, and so many of the themes of the suffrage movement come up in that clip. Um, maybe first and foremost, the debate over strategy and tactics, which was ongoing. Um, and Alice Paul is intent on holding politicians' feet to the fire, and she doesn't mind if doing so costs her support, even her own mother. Um, eventually, she's going to ramp up the protests further, and women are going to be arrested and jailed. They're going to go on hung hunger strikes. Elaine, how did those tactics move the crusade forward? Well, the suffragists really had to be ingenious. They, they were forced to be because um, even at the, at the beginning, no one really wanted to hear about this. No one wanted to hear about the idea of women's rights, of uh, her going beyond the domestic sphere of the home. So they had to really um, bring attention. And so they master some of the great uh, protest tactics that are still used today. You mentioned picketing. They also used, um, uh, you know, uh, marches, which had been used, of course, but not in the the size that the suffragists begin to assemble for their marches through major cities. This wasn't just the Washington March. There were many, many throughout the country. Um, they also do things like refuse to pay their taxes. They say we. No taxation without representation. Wasn't that the slogan of the American Revolution? Well, we are taxpayers and we don't have representation. And so there are quite a few. There's a whole history of women suffragists refusing to pay their taxes. They lose their cows, their cars. Uh, Anna Howard Shaw loses her car because she refuses to pay taxes. Um, and then they, um, Alice Paul goes a step further and says, we're going to pick it we're going to stand as silent sentinels. And it's a very controversial decision because you may be gaining attention, but are you alienating both the public and the legislators that they're having to persuade in Congress? And this, that tactic uh, was very controversial, just as today, uh, deciding what tactics, what strategies to use in, in reform movements is still controversial. Yeah, protest is tricky because it brings a lot of noise and attention, and that's obviously crucial, but uh, it also arouses opposition and provokes backlash. Um, Secretary Clinton, in 1917, radical protest in the nation's capital was a completely new phenomenon. Um, would it be fair to say the suffragists left kind of a playbook for making our voices heard even when no one wants to listen? I think that uh, they did. I think that uh, the uh, very 
uh, militant stance that Alice Paul uh, took, which was in keeping with her own experience when she had studied in England and had worked with the Pankhursts and, and the uh, quite militant uh, British uh, suffragettes, uh, did lay the groundwork for uh, a lot of pressure uh, that had to be then combined with uh, what you artfully um, portray in the documentary, Michelle, the inside game. So you could say the protests, the demonstrations uh, being ha hauled off to jail. And remember, before they were hauled off to jail, they were subjected to enormous amount of harassment and, and physical assault from uh, bystanders and watchers. Uh, they were accused of being traitorous because their protesting and picketing in front of the White House uh, coincided with uh, the U.S. entry into World War I. And even some of the signs they held up to uh, taunt Wilson, you know, talked about how you claim you're going to Europe to liberate Europe and, and help people there. Well, what about all the American women who are not being uh, given our rights? So it was a highly charged atmosphere. And when the women were arrested, because it was a political movement they were part of, um, they refused to pay a fine. Uh, they insisted upon going to jail. Uh, the conditions in the jails were quite terrible. Uh, they went on hunger strikes when uh, their claim to be political prisoners was rejected and they were called trespassers and uh, loiterers and everything else they were charged with. So they go on hunger strikes and, and then they were force fed. A number of American women protesters were actually force fed in the jails of Washington, DC. Uh, something again that I didn't know until I immersed myself and my daughter and I wrote a book about you know gutsy women and we looked at the lives of a lot of the suffragists. So this was a huge risk on the part of Alice Paul and, and her strategy. But I think in retrospect, it was a necessary step. Just like today, we see the protests in our streets about Black Lives Matter and the demands for changes. It's an important catalyst to try to bring these issues finally to public awareness, but it also has to be matched with people in legislatures, in Congress, in you know, governors and mayor's offices actually changing uh, laws and regulations and holding people accountable. So I think it's a, a great example of how protest is important, but alone it may not be enough. And what the suffragists did was to combine the demand for the vote, uh, evidence in the protest with the inside lobbying and politicking that changed you know, some of the legislators' minds, both in Washington and then eventually in the states. We're gonna actually show a clip in a little bit that speaks to those themes. So I'm really glad that you brought that up. Um, just to finish out on the last thing we saw, uh, we see Mary Church Terrell join Alice Paul's protest. Um, and this is you know, emblematic of kind of what happens a lot in the suffrage mo movement, which is uh, black women are active, uh, but as you see throughout the series, um, they're marginalized and then recruited when needed, sort of. Martha, why would somebody like Mary Church Terrell have made common cause with an Alice Paul who showed herself willing to embrace political expediency at the expense of black suffragists? Terrell has been um, a very uh, forceful advocate for women's votes for a very long time by the time we get to the 1913 parade. Um, yeah. We may not see her um, because um, she has done much of her work, her most important work, not within suffrage associations at all, but she's done her work um, through leadership in the National Association for Colored Women. Um, so this is um, goes back to your first question also, doesn't it, right? That this history um, in some ways is um, hidden um, because black women don't, um, 
uh, operate by way of suffrage associations um, very often. And instead, they work through a club model um, in the National Association for Colored Women. Um, they work through their sororities. Um, they work through African-American churches. So Terrell is someone who we can find very easily doing this work for a very long time. But as an individual, um, and she's with hundreds and thousands of other Black women doing this same work, but she's a, a, a particular figure at the same time. Um, she's a Washingtonian um, who feels a kind of ownership over her city and the politics in her city. Um, she is a teacher. Um, she has been um, serving on the Board of Education for the district. Um, she is behind the scenes, a lobbyist and a public advocate for anti-lynching legislation. So she is someone who comes to this story, um, a very seasoned politician. And one of the things that is um, signature about Mary Church Terrell is that she is not easily bowed by, black, by white women's racism. She has always maintained um, relationships with white suffragists. She has from time to time in a sort of ritualistic way um, appeared during their conventions and um, been there to speak on behalf of black women and their interests in the long fight for the vote. Um, but in this moment in 1913, um, Terrell is going to come home from the speaker circuit um, the day before this march. She will have been in New York um, speaking publicly against lynching and return to Washington on this occasion. And I take it to be, in a sense, a counter to Alice Paul, who we know has a sense that she might know better than Black women themselves about where they should be and how they should be in this movement. And it's Terrell and a handful of other Black women who show up on that day in March to um, say, not so fast, Alice Paul, right? We are here um, to guide our own political futures, um, to have a say in that. And on some occasions, particularly on the public stage, that means coming into not only contact with, but in confrontation with anti-Black racism. For women like Terrell, there is no pulling apart. There is no extricating the problem of racism um, from the problem of sexism. And they are there to hold this movement's feet to the fire, um, if you will, in the way that Paul is holding uh, Wilson's feet to the fire. They are there to hold um, white suffragists feet to the fire and to make the record um, that racism too must be part of the solution if black women are to enjoy political rights. I'm often asked um, if black women were arrested as a result of picketing. And my sense is, is that once the arrest started happening, uh, Terrell stopped going to the protests. Is that, do you have a sense of that, Martha? I don't, I also don't know of any evidence that um, many black women participate in the pickets. Um, Terrell is among the few, if not the only um, black women to participate. It's important to say that black women in Washington, D.C. do not need to participate in pickets to be harassed, whether they're being harassed by white men who are civilians or they are being harassed by um, white police officers in Washington, D.C. Um, black women know very well the vagaries of what it means to occupy the streets in Washington, and they need not engage in picketing or civil disobedience in order to learn those lessons. Um, as you all know, part two of the vote is concerned primarily with disagreements over strategy in the suffrage movement and tracks two distinct paths toward the 19th Amendment, um, led by two equally determined but very different women, Alice Paul, the radical who protests, and Carrie Chapman Catt, the moderate pragmatist who cultivates and cajoles politicians. In this next clip, which narrates the crucial House vote on the amendment in 1918, it becomes clear that the two approaches, as you said, Secretary Clinton, uh, are working in tandem, if not exactly together, and are starting to have an effect. Let's take a look. By late morning on January 10th, 1918, it was standing room only in the House, with nervous suffragists counting and recounting their too close to call tallies. When at last the clerk announced the final vote, 274 in favor, 136 opposed, a mad cheer went up from the galleries. <laughs> 
The amendment had passed the required two-thirds majority by a single vote. As exultant suffragists made their way through the Capitol corridors and out into the streets, crying and singing hymns, few could doubt that Wilson's last-minute support had made a difference. What accounted for his conversion was less clear. Carrie Cat believed that it was her slow cultivation, her slow political seduction of him, proving American women deserved the vote proving their patriotism through wartime, proving their citizenship. And Alice Paul claims credit because she embarrassed him in the eyes of the world by calling him a hypocrite. They were both right. You could make the argument that Kat and Paul were almost working in tandem and that if you didn't know better and if you didn't know the level of animosity that existed, you might think that this was actually a strategy. This is not unusual in social political movements. What happens is that there is a split off of a more militant wing and there are severe disagreements about tactics and strategy. But the upshot of it is that the two efforts work very well together where the more militant wing is really pushing things forward and shifting the agenda and calling a lot of attention, but it makes the mainstream seem much more acceptable. The reality is the moderate looks moderate only because somebody out there is making a fool of themselves or, or pushing in the line a little further. If not, they're the radical. When Alice Paul's boisterous troops returned to the Women's Party headquarters, flush from the House victory, they found Miss Paul was already there bent over her desk. 11 votes to win before we can pass the Senate, was all she said. So one of the things that surprised me most about this history um, was how slight most of the victories were. Uh, very often, as in the House, by the narrowest of margins, a vote or two. Um, and I guess because I'd been told my whole life that women had been given or granted the vote, that, was, that came as a shock to me. Um, Secretary Clinton, what does it tell us about the obstacles suffragists face, that the victories were so, the margins were so narrow? It, I think it shows how hard it was. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're still at a moment in our country's evolution where we're fighting over voting and we're seeing all kinds of obstacles thrown up to try to make it more difficult for groups of Americans, uh, African Americans, young people, Native Americans, uh, to actually exercise their right to vote. So think about what it was like 100 years ago when uh, this ran counter to so many of the social norms about a woman's place. You know, white women, obviously, black women, of course, you know, what, what could be uh, even imagined about having uh, women uh, involved in any kind of political exercise, including the fundamental constitutional right to vote. And I think that what you show in the documentary is such a reminder about what a struggle this has been, because you were going against uh, sexism and racism. You were going against ideas about uh, uh, where a woman's place was uh, as a domestic uh, person who kept the home um, or as someone who worked uh, in the home, uh, somebody who didn't really belong in the public or political arena. And then, of course, as you point out, you had corporate interests, uh, good old corporations lining up to prevent uh, women getting the right to vote. And Elaine Weiss, in her wonderful book, uh, The Woman's Hour, you know, details, all these lobbyists, liquor lobbyists, railroad lobbyists, other corporate lobbyists, all lining up uh, in Tennessee, which was the last stand um, about the ratification of the amendment. Power does not give in. It has to be taken. And, you know, I don't know how many times people have to be reminded of that. Yes, there can be good people uh, who want you to have that right, but they are still often fighting against forces arrayed against change, moving from the status quo. And as we see today, literally trying to turn the clock back. So, 
you know, those narrow margins uh, back then are a reminder that the struggle is not over today. And what do you think was the key to women at least finally winning the ballot? Like what quality or um, uh, approach enabled them to stay the course? Well, Michelle, I, I would love to hear from um, Elaine and Martha too, but it, it was a deep sense of justice. I mean, this was wrong and it was wrong um, going far back in history and it only began to be uh, understood and verbalized as wrong starting in you know the 18th and very early 19th century where you know, women and some men uh, stood up and said, you know, you, you can't treat women as though they're not fully formed human beings. I mean, it, you know, it was slaves and women and non-property owning men who were left out of the Constitution. And and so this this was so deep. And, you know, there there are a lot of historians who can tell us all why why that is kind of in the DNA of a, a human evolution. But it was this abiding sense of it not being just, not being fair, not being right. And certainly at some point, our American uh, aspirations uh, to equality uh, had to be reckoned with. And again, that reckoning still goes on today. Uh, but I think that the women who certainly formed the uh, the beginning of the organized um, suffrage movement in the United States all the way up until finally the vote was taken in Nashville, Tennessee to make it real, uh, were motivated by a burning sense of wrong. You know, certainly sexism and misogyny and racism and inequality and injustice, it, this just could not be allowed to stand. And uh, I, I think that uh, that determination and persistence was key to uh, finally being successful. Yeah, the endurance, the incredible endurance of these women, right? Um, Elaine, you say in the film that uh, the, the um, you know, the, Cherry, Cap Cherry Chapman Cat and Alice Paul are both right in the sense that both of their efforts were needed to uh, kind of box Wilson in. Do you think that social movements always need both? Well, that's a really fascinating question. And of course, we're answering that every day um, right now. And there's always, you know, looking at history, even, even from um, a... a vantage point of, of time, we see that reform movements often have this uh, dialectic of, um, do you stay the course? Do you use um, methods that are tried and true and won't shake up uh, the power, alienate those who you need to persuade? Or do you uh, be more confrontational, more disruptive, as we'd say today, and take on um, issues in a way that will rattle people and perhaps make them angry and perhaps be counterproductive. So I think what Carrie Catt sees in Alice Paul is that she's naive, that she uh, thinks that just protesting and just making a fuss is going to change things. Now that's not, that's not being fair because the Women's Party is not just out there protesting, they're also lobbying. They're also working with congressmen and then legislators. They too, as Carrie Catt did in her offices, had opposition research files. They knew every legislator, every congressman, knew the foibles, knew which buttons to push. And so for Carrie Catt, this is a dangerous, um, move to, to make this public confrontation against the president, against all Democrats. Uh, the Women's Party actually uh, is instructed to um, campaign against all Democrats because they're the party in power, even though, um, even against uh, men, because they were all men, 
um, who have supported suffrage. So it's almost counterproductive. It's, it's not a good political strategy. Uh, it doesn't work, but, and Carrie Katz sees that and says, you know, she's just being naive, just she's being hot-headed. And for Alice Paul, she sees that this movement has been going on for so long with so little to show and says, we've got to break out. We have, we have got to do that. And so you, you do have a sort of good cop, bad cop dynamic. Um, as Secretary Clinton said, you have the inside game uh, and the outside game. You have picketers outside. You have Alice, uh, you have Carrie Cat inside talking to Woodrow Wilson, um, trying to convert him, as uh, Beth Ben uh, points out in the film, trying to convince him this is good for his political future. And I think we have to remember that as much as I'd like to think that the 19th Amendment finally was able to go through because of a deep sense of time's up, it's been long enough, it's time to pass this, it's time for women to have a voice in their government. It was also, um, politically expedient for the president who needed women to perhaps support his effort to join the League of Nations. It was expedient for Congress to no longer use the excuses they'd been able to use that women were weak and not smart and uh, couldn't really handle heavy duty political thinking. They had just worked in the war uh, in so many roles that had been uh, never asked of them before. Uh, black women, white women, it, it, it was time that a man standing up and saying, women are the weaker sex, we have to protect them. And they're, you know, flying airplanes um, and they are uh, in coal mines and munitions plants. So I think it's also the kind of pressure that both sides, Alice Paul's Women's Party and um, Carrie Katz National Association have put uh, the political men in political power uh, in a bias. And that's what finally gets it through. Right, right. So it's a, you know, it's a lengthy social movement that requires creativity and endurance. Um, and I think for black women who are involved in it and other women of color, it takes yet more of the same because we get to 1920 and the 19th amendment um, and it's been enshrined in the Constitution, and there's a presidential election in the offing, and yet many women of color are still barred from the ballot box. Um, and it will take another half century and a new law, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, to guarantee that access. Martha, how did Black women address their ongoing disenfranchisement? What do you see happen in the years after 1920? I think there are uh, two... Um myths, if you will, that uh, enshroud 1920 when it comes to African-American women, right? One myth, I think we've already dispelled today, the notion that all American women win the vote in 1920. Many, too many African-American women do not precisely because they live in states that are going to impose poll taxes and grandfather clauses, um, literacy tests, and violence um, as a way to keep Black women from the polls. But the other myth is that Black women don't vote. And what we know is that by the time we get to 1920, African-American women are, in fact, already voting in major states like New York and Illinois and California um, and are part of the Republican Party machine and really learning and practicing what it means to exercise political power even before the 19th Amendment. Um, as the amendment is coming through ratification, African-American women are organizing citizenship schools and suffrage schools, um, even the, in the American South to prepare one another to confront registrars and to get their names on the rolls so that they can indeed vote, cast ballots in November of 1920. But you're right, of course, to point out that in some ways, August 26 of 1920 marks the beginning of a new voter rights movement for African-American women, uh, one that they wage in collaboration with African-American men, it will require the defeat of Jim Crow um, through Brown versus Board of Education, the Civil Rights Act 1964, the Voting Rights Act in 1965, before African-American women across the country will begin to hold to possess the kind of political power that the 19th Amendment appeared 
to promise. Um, and so um, there is indeed an important next chapter um, in the story. And it begins, frankly, when Alice Paul um, rebuffs black women who approach her in 1921 and ask her to um, come into coalition with them to in fact make the 19th Amendment um, promise speak to all American women, including black women. Um, Hallie Quinn Brown will be the head of the National um, Association for Colored Women in that year. And she will call on Alice Paul, um, ask her to join. And, and Paul will say no. Paul is all ready to move on to the Equal Rights Amendment and a new chapter in her story. Um, and black women are left um, if you will, to do the work that they do indeed do over that nearly half century that takes us to the Voting Rights Act. Speaking of creativity and endurance, um, I want to switch gears for a second here and take some questions that have come from the audience. Um, the first one is from Jean, and she's in Waterford, and she asks, how has politics changed as a result of women getting the vote? Secretary Clinton, do you want to take a stab at that? Well, I actually believe that um, the the in, enfranchisement and then uh, the participation of women in politics has made a real difference uh, in our country. And I think you can break it down into you know a couple of different categories. There is academic uh, evidence. I talk more from experience than uh, than that, but. Uh, where women often are interested in issues that uh, reflect their own life experiences that then come to the forefront uh, of political debate and then legislative policy making. Uh, I think that uh, a lot of uh, work has been done to uh, try to lift up uh, a whole suite of issues that women have been involved in. I mean, the Equal Rights Amendment you know, is still kicking around, trying to uh, enshrine uh, women's equality in our constitution. And that effort um, was led by and continues to be led by women when it passed uh, uh, the Virginia legislature just uh, this past uh, um, months where it was finally able to be passed because uh, not only did the political makeup of the legislature changed, but women took much more uh, prominent roles. And so I do think, it's not like every woman believes the same thing in politics. We know absolutely that is not true, but there have been enough women um, who have been at the forefront of running for office and holding office and even running for president. Um, you know, Shirley Chisholm uh, remains, you know, one of uh, my uh, favorite uh, women in American politics uh, with her outspoken uh, stance on issues and her willingness to take on the power structure first in Brooklyn and then in the Congress and across the country uh, and who talked very forcefully about being a black woman in politics and what that meant to her. So it's representation, it's actualization of uh, the promise of uh, American politics and it's actual change. Um, so I do think that women in politics um, have a lot to uh, show for their participation. Uh, there still is a lot more to do. And I'll just end with a little global aside, which is the research that's being done about how much better countries run by women have done during the COVID pandemic <laughs> from New Zealand to Taiwan, to Germany, to Finland, et cetera. And you know, maybe it's not a very big sample, but the kind of inclusive leadership that actually uh, followed the evidence and listened to science uh, has proven to be uh, quite effective. <laughs> Messages coming through loud and clear. <laughs> um, so this question is from Nancy from Milton. Are there lessons from the suffragette movement? I would call it the suffragist movement. Um, are there lessons from the movement that can apply to coalition building around women's issues today? Martha, you wanna? I can jump in. Um, so I think there is, um, I guess I would term the, the history that you tell in the vote is a kind of cautionary tale. Right. Um, the ways in which um, a political vision that is um, too narrow and um, too devoid, in a sense, of vision um, 
leaves a kind of legacy um, that in this example, um, we continue to work to dismantle even today, right? The, the political distance, um, the political tension, um, the political challenges that black and white women face in the political sphere um, is uh, an issue that we, um, in a sense, the suffragists bequeath to us. Um, and so uh, when I think about it, um, you know, part of what I ask myself is what would this country look like? How would this country be if in 1920, Alice Paul had indeed linked arms with Hallie Quinn Brown and said, now we go forward together um, as American women across the color line, um, regardless of the color line, um, that in some ways we can see then how the story of women's votes is linked to the story of systemic racism in this country. Um, and so uh, for me, it's a cautionary tale that requires us to understand how deeply entrenched that to which we aspire to in the 21st century um, is in an old history. So coalition building is obviously one legacy, as Martha pointed out. What other lessons can we can be gleaned from the women's suffrage movement as we strive toward a society where equality and political economic opportunities are truly available to all Americans? This is from Sarah from Wellesley. Well, um, I think, again, uh, one of the, the attributes that we it's the idea that these sort of changes really do take take time. It we don't want it to take as long as it usually does, but there first has to be an entire education process, which is the separate just had to uh, educate American men, but also American women about the possibility of having rights, responsibilities, taking on the mantle of citizenship. That was such an alien idea, just as full equality seems not alien, but far off uh, even today. And so that sense of education, of, of understanding what's possible, of um, talking about it, of giving I, fundamental and specific ideas about how change can be made. And that's happening right now. I'm, I'm very pleased to hear that. I hear it in, in the public sphere. I hear it in conversations. And that kind of education has to precede um, any kind of legal or law changes. And that's the, the 70 years uh, leading up to the 19th Amendment. A lot of that is educational. And, and then it's the persistence aspect is understanding that that one march in 1913 is not going to do it, and the march in New York is not going to do it, and the pickets alone are not going to do it. It takes a coordinated strategy, and it takes um, political follow-up. It takes a strategy of how are you going to make these changes in the law. You have to change societal attitudes first, and then you can change laws. Um, and that has to happen in a symbiotic way. And I think you have to understand there'll be defeats, and there'll be more defeats, and then there'll be some successes that you can build on. And hopefully, as Martha says, we can learn from the mistakes of the suffragists, because they certainly made quite a few over seven decades. But I think that idea that you have to persist, you have to keep going. They were defeated, they were knocked down, literally they were beaten and they stood back up and said, okay, we gotta try another tactic or we just have to try again. One of the reasons I was so excited to take on this project was that I thought it would serve, it might serve as an antidote to my fairly cynical view of electoral politics. Um, which it did, uh, because you can't help but be inspired by these women, three generations of them who had such faith in the promise of democracy that many of them dedicated their lives to winning the right to participate in it. Um, Carrie Chapman Catt once described the vote 
uh, as a power, a weapon of offense and defense, a prayer. <laughs> and I wonder what it is to each of you. What exactly did women win once they won the right to vote? I think power is a key word for me. Um, and it helps us to appreciate the ways in which, um, on the one hand, women who win the vote um, understand themselves to have um, in their hands and in, in an instrument of power. Um, we understand why other women persist um, over a very long time in order to um, wield that instrument of power. And we also understand the kind of versatility that the women I write about exhibit, <clears throat> which is that when they can't vote, they lobby. When they can't vote, they organize. When they can't vote, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that the vote is never enough. Um, even as it is a key um, instrument in women's political power, even today. That quote from Carrie Catt is, is one of my favorites. And she calls the vote a power and a prayer. And, and I, that really resonates with me because for me, it's, it's the hope of perfecting our democracy, of improving our democracy. And every election is a chance to do that in some small or large way. Sometimes it's protecting the very essence of our democracy is at stake. But I think that the idea that the vote is a voice, and actually that's where the word suffrage comes from, comes from a prayer and from a voice. And the idea that I do have a voice, every American has a voice, and my vote is, um, is the same as Martha's vote and even Secretary Clinton's vote. Uh, we all have one vote. And that is a very special notion for me of, of equality, of a voice, and of hope that we can improve things. Every, and every generation has to go through that uh, several times. So that's when Carrie Cat talks about the vote being a prayer, uh, that's what it means to me. We have, we have just a little bit of time, but I'm wondering, Secretary Clinton, if you have anything you want to add to that? Well, I, I certainly agree with um, both of uh, Martha and Elaine's point, and I too love the cat uh, comment about power and prayer. I think it's also important to remember um, that the vote truly does provide an opportunity uh, to see changes that you agree with. And we should remind ourselves that the people on the other side trying to prevent uh, women from voting, African Americans from voting, Native Americans from voting, they clearly have an agenda. And they believe at the heart of their agenda uh, is uh, the necessity of stopping people who disagree with it from exercising their vote and their voice. Uh, in trying to make changes that will benefit, I would argue, the, the great majority of Americans. And so I view it as both offense and defense. And when people say to me, Michelle, as they often do, it doesn't make any difference, my vote doesn't matter, everybody is the same. Look, I have as much uh, reason to be cynical and somewhat disappointed in uh, electoral politics as anybody, but I remain very um, hopeful and, and even optimistic that if people will understand the power of the vote and use it, harness it uh, to lay down markers about what we expect from not just our government, but frankly from each other, we can move toward that more perfect union. Uh, and so lately I've been saying, particularly to young people, protest and vote. Be in the streets, make your voices heard. Don't let people turn away from this moment of moral reckoning, but then also vote because we're not gonna get the changes that we need if we don't have people in office who number one, feel like we do, but number two, understand that you know the political calculus has changed and they better support the George Floyd Policing Injustice Act that just passed the House on a bipartisan base and has gone to the Senate to die unless we get people uh, who will change their attitudes. So 
If you care about any issue, you care about any kind of positive future, then exercise both your power and your prayer uh, mm -hmm. to bring about the kind of positive change that is so long overdue. I am extremely sad to say that that's all the time we have for this incredible conversation, um, which has been amazing for me. Um, we thank you all for spending an hour of your afternoon with us today. My thanks to Secretary Clinton, Martha Jones, and Elaine Weiss for sharing your insights on the history of the women's suffrage movement and reminding us all of the power inherent in the franchise. I also want to thank Paula Kerger, PBS, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, our series funders, your local member stations, and all of you. It's your support that makes our work possible. Um, part two of The Vote airs tonight at 9, 8 central. You can watch the full film anytime at AmericanExperience.org and the PBS video app. Thanks so much for joining us.